Welcome everybody to our Wednesday webinar series with the Commemorative Air Force. We are so excited today to have this great group of people. Man, registration has been through the roof on this one. To get to listen to Brad Pilgrim and John Agather talk about the life and times of Diamond Lil. So this is a wonderful story and it's a very rich story and two guys who really know where the bodies are buried and all the back information. So I'm super excited to bring this to you and want to give a big shout out to Leah Block for all the efforts she's gone through on every one of these webinars to help us put these together and make them happen and get them live streamed and all those things that happen here. So let me go ahead while people are logging in, we'll just uh, start talking about what's going to happen here and first introduce you to our panelists today. John, would you go ahead and give a brief intro to the audience? I know everybody knows you, but tell them a little bit about yourself, please. Uh, I'm John Agatha. Uh, so uh, I've been around the CAF pretty much my whole life. Uh, my dad was a, a, an early member of the CAF, obviously very much involved with Fifi. And uh, also, uh, not known very much his involvement with uh, Diamond Lil and the CAF acquisition of that airplane and, and actually this, the Femex acquisition of that airplane as well. Um, the, the exciting thing for me to uh, do today was really listen to Brad go off and talk about this because he knows it way better than I do. But Diamond Lil, back when it was uh, the Pemex corporate airplane, is the very first airplane I ever flew on when I was uh, six weeks old. So uh, I'm a, um, I've been a life member of the CAF uh, since the 70s. Uh, B-29 squadron member, flew the B-29, flew the B-24 a little bit. So I know a little bit about the airplane. Uh, that was a long, long time ago. And um, obviously grew up flying uh, the Bucket of Bolts, the Twin Beach, which is now part of the B-29, B-24 squadron. So that's kind of my background. All right. Thanks, John, and welcome. And Brad. Please tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, my name is Brad Pilgrim, and I I uh, am just a kid who grew up hanging out at the airport, as, as you know, out in West Texas. And uh, my family would go to Harlingen every year for the air show when I was a kid. And uh, I was I met these people who were just larger than life to me, who started this organization. The the people that I say really make the warbird business interesting. Uh, that was the people who were in the CF back in those days. And I just uh, got an interest in it that's never gone away from me. And I've been a member of the CF for a long time. And, and I used to engineer the B-29 a lot. And, and I'm he still heavily involved with the B-29 and the B-24. But I'm, I'm kind of the, I'm the official historian of the B-29 and B-24 squadron. And I've been fortunate over the years to collect up a lot of documents and stuff that were uh, misplaced, I guess is the easiest way to put it. And I was the one who wound up keeping those because I'm a pack rat with anything involving airplanes, to be quite honest. And I've been able to stand on the shoulders of a lot of people who did a lot of research into the B-24 in particular before I ever came along, who uh, have kind of been forgotten by history. But I'm just a, I'm just a historian of, of sorts because I, some days I can't do nothing else but that. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of confusion about Diamond Lil, uh, what kind of airplane it is and all that kind of stuff. And it's some of it honestly has been has been put out inaccurately by the CAF over the years. Uh, we're talking this goes back to 1967 is where the confusion starts with the CAF. And a lot of it has made it into books and on the Internet. And I'm constantly trying to get the truth out. But uh, it's a lot harder to do that. So hopefully what I would like to accomplish today is is get some people to know the actual truth about the airplane, where it really did come from, and its and its history and, and what it really is. Well, let's go ahead and get started on this. While I'm the moderator today, I'm actually more in the way on this story, so I'm going to get out of the way and let you guys get going because we've got a lot of material to go through. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, the, the B-24, you know, you'll, you'll constantly have a fight between which is the better airplane, the B-17 or the B-24. Um, this is not intended to be a history of the B-24 itself, more this specific airplane, but there was 18,000 of these airplanes built, a little over 18,000. And where Diamond Lil came from is there was 20 B-24As, the very early models that the Army Air Corps had slated for themselves. 
they were diverted to the French because the French needed bombers. And this was in early 1940. Well, then the French got overran by the Germans and the Royal Air Force took that order of 20 airplanes. So literally what they did was these airplanes that were on the production line in various stages of completion. You can see in the picture, a lot of it was done outdoors on the ramp there at San Diego. Diamond Lil is one of those airplanes. I just can't tell exactly which one. But um, these these airplanes were uh, basically converted for British use. And what they did was they just took a slot of serial numbers that were going to be for the American airplanes, pulled those serial numbers away, and the RAF assigned British serial numbers to those airplanes. The real serial number that Diamond Lil would have been had it never gone to the RAF, it would have been 40-2366. That serial number was pulled off the airplane before it was really under underway, to be honest. That number was thrown back into the pot. And several years later, there was, or not several years later, a few months later, there was a B-24D that rolled off the assembly line with that serial number 2366. That airplane survived the war as a trainer and ended up being scrapped in Altus, Oklahoma, like in 1945 at a salvage yard. So that's why the serial number 402366 doesn't appear on this airplane. Had it stayed with the U.S., that's what it would have been. Uh, next slide. You can see the, the short nose on the airplane. This is a hallmark of the early model B-24s, the A models, and the LB-30Bs. You can see... In the back, you see there's a tarp that's covering the top of the airplane. You'll see here in a minute, that covers where the gun tub used to be. So next slide. This is what the airplane looked like. This is not Diamond Lil. I think this is AM-929. Diamond Lil is AM-927. This is what the airplane looked like when it rolled off the factory. Uh, it was accepted by the British on May 17th, 1941. We have the signed receipt where the British signed for the airplane. It's a common misconception that the RAF never accepted it. That is just not true. The RAF did, the British Aircraft Commission, the Purchasing Commission, did buy and pay for the airplane, and we have the paperwork. But this is what it would have looked like. Next slide. Had we not sold it to the British, this is what the airplane would have looked like in American service. The neutrality flag were only on certain airplanes, but that is an A model B-24. And if you remember the previous picture, the paint's exactly the same. The colors are exactly the same. The black going all the way up to the top of the airplane, that's the same. Literally, the only difference in the British and the American airplanes externally was these the American stars put on there over the roundels. I mean, they literally placed them on top of each other and then the American serial number in the back. But this is what the airplane would have looked like had it gone to, had it stayed with the, with the Americans. Next slide. This is what a, a, a model B-24 looks like. You see the short nose on it, which Diamond Lil had. And you see this airplane actually has bomb bays. Diamond Lil was built from the factory with bomb bays. It was a fully combat configured airplane. We've got the receipt and the paperwork where they changed the bomb shackles out to British single point style versus American single point style. Um, it's a common misconception once again that this airplane came from the factory with no bomb bays and that is just not true either. It was definitely a bomber and had it not gone to be a training airplane for the British, it would have gone on to Europe and, and become a patrol aircraft with, with the uh, shore patrol which is what the rest of the B-24As that went to the British did. Next slide. So this is kind of the history of the airplane during the war. It was accepted by the RAF on the 17th of May of 41. It went to TWA at Kansas City on the 18th of June of 41. And we have the receipt where it was signed by TWA, accepting it for the Brits. And then it went to the Eagle's Nest Training Center in Albuquerque. That happened sometime in late June, very early July. What they were doing there was the British needed multi-engine conversion training and, and celestial navigation training. That was, you know, using the stars to shoot your course and all that kind of stuff. That's what the airplane was gone, was sent to TWA for because they were running a couple of training schools around the country. They had a B-17 and a few other planes, but the British loaned them this airplane. And why they picked this particular one, who knows? It just, it, it was number 18 out of those 20 that were diverted to the British for whatever reason, this airplane was picked and, and was going to be used as this trainer. On the 24th of July in 41, they landed the airplane and the right brake locked up and slewed the airplane sideways, collapsed the right gear, tore the bomb bays out of it, tore the belly and the nose up really bad. 
And in the report written by the guys who were in it, they actually say the words, the Bombay doors were strewn along the dirt. So the airplane was still convert, you know, uh, configured as a bomber at that point. The Consolidated Aircraft Corporation put in a bid for $80,000 to repair this airplane. And for whatever reason, we've got the bid paperwork, but for whatever reason, it was never taken up. In 1943, they actually canceled their bid. But the airplane was repaired and ferried back to Consolidated San Diego, where it was built sometime or around December of 1941. Next slide. And what they did there, uh, the airplane was so torn up, it, it really needed a complete rebuild. And Consolidated, they talked to the British and said, can we just keep this airplane to make into a transport for factory use? And the British were fine with that because by this point, they really weren't happy with the LB-30s you know, uh, uh, performance in Europe because they didn't have self-sealing fuel tanks and all this. So what they did to Diamond Lil was they took all the Bombay structure out and they put in basically a canoe. You can see the panel laying on the ground there. That's what they put in where the Bombay was and made it just one entire compartment. And uh, next slide, please. Let me ask you a question before you, you go yep. off of this picture. If you go back a second. Mm -hmm. So sitting behind them, so that single tail B-24, the what, what is it, PBY-4 or something like that? PB, PB-4Y, yeah. Yeah, PB-4Y. So th that tail conversion was done in Oklahoma from what Tex Hill had remembered. But it looks like they may be doing that here too. Is this also San Diego? Yeah, that is San Diego. It may be a plane that flew in there. I don't know. I don't really know much about the production of those. Yeah, because they look like they're more complete than what you're yeah. talking about here. So is right. this this Lil sitting here on the left? I understand that this is Diamond Lil being built on the side there. There's no yeah. way to prove it, but that's yeah. what I have always been told. That's what it said on the back of the original picture. Right. And that's and basically that the canoe is the new bottom that they're putting in in place. That's of where the new bottom. And you'll, you'll see that in the next picture. You'll see where they had to put that in. Okay. Next slide. So you can see there at the bottom where they took the Bombay out and they just put that entire structure in there. And that sealed up the Bombays. And you can see the windows cut in there. And um, the reason they did this was consolidated. They basically needed a, a company plane, not, not an executive transport, but they were looking at a way to get into the, the transport airplane business, but there was nowhere into bomber production and they were still building seaplanes and stuff at the time. There was nowhere in their production to start a whole nother line of airplane. So they took a B-24 that was damaged and said, hey, let's, let's test this idea. Next slide. Well, to, just to add to this, it would make sense to me that that is Diamond Lil because of, yeah. of the bottom that's being placed into it right there with, with that window configuration, which is what you see next. Yeah. The fact that it's being done in San Diego really leans to the fact that it is Diamond Lil. Seven, the actual cargo version of the B-24s, they were all built in Fort Worth. But this is what Diamond Lil looked like after they rebuilt it. And you'll notice it still has the short nose on it. That comes into play in a little bit. You notice the engine cowlings, you'll see that they're round. They're, they're not the oblong, oval-shaped cowlings that most people associate with B-24s. The reason being is that the B-24A, being an early model airplane, it didn't have the turbos on it. And that's where that extra vent comes in on the side of the cowling of, of a, uh, of a uh, standard model B-24. So a lot of people will tell you, you know, that's a sign that it's not really a B-24. Well, no, that's right there is how it came out of the factory as far as the engine assembly goes. Next page or slide, I guess. Later on, they stripped the paint off, and this is this is Diamond Lil herself and Consolidated Haver, and you see it still has the short nose on it. The short nose, they knew, Isaac Ladden, who helped design the airplane, they knew when they put the short nose on it that they probably should have lengthened it because it caused CG problems, and the lengthening of the nose happened on the very next model B-24 after the A was built. So the only airplanes that ever had the short nose were the B-24As. Uh, next slide. Okay, a lot of people think, I thought it was a C-87. That's what they always say. It's a C-87, which is the specific cargo version. That's not true. What happened is you see here, the prototype C-87 was a D model. There's the serial number and it crashed in Arizona in 1942. It had the same basic damage that Diamond Lil did. Uh, I've heard it was torn up actually a little bit worse, but it's the same kind of damage. 
um, there's a consolidated letter that we have from September 42 talking about wanting this steady stream of transports to come out of Fort Worth. And when they get that going, they wanted to get three or four more A model B-24s, which weren't being utilized except as, as trainers and turn those into cargo planes. And then it says here, this letter of 6 May of 43, the conversion of AM927 in the, into a transport has been the primary reason for the development of the C-87. In reality, Diamond Lil was not the prototype C-87. It never was a C-87. It was the prototype that inspired the prototype of the C-87. All 287 of the C-87s were all built here in Fort Worth. Diamond Lil was built originally, started as a B-24A, very quickly turned into an LB-30B, which is the British export version of the B-24, and that's all it's ever been. It has never been a C-87. It just kind of looks like one, but it's a very common misconception that this is what it was. Next slide. So this is what a real C87 looks like. See, it's got the long nose on it and everything like that. And look at the engine cowlings. It has the oval engine cowlings like I was talking about on later model B24s. Every C87 ever built looked exactly like that when it rolled out of the factory. That's not what Diamond Lil looked like ever. Next slide. During the final war years when they were really using it as a transport, they had acquired another B24 or LB30 at consolidated that they converted into this same sort of airplane, except it was a long nose one. And they took the nose and the V windshield off of an RY3, which is kind of a Navy version of a, of a B24, has kind of like the PB4Y. It's the long nose. And that entire cockpit section was grafted on the Diamond Lil at the factory. And that's why the airplane has the long nose and the windshield configuration that it has. The galley, the stove, ice box, you know, some of the interior was done. It was far from a fancy airplane. It was very much green canvas and 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 that kind of thing. It had PBY type QECs. That's the quick engine change kit. What happened is the B-24A being a very limited production airplane, it had the 1830 engine, which is the same as the B-24, uh, same as the PBY Catalina and most C-47s. What they did was, since there were so few parts for the A model B-24, in order to make it maintainable easily, they just took PBY QECs and grafted them on to the, to the firewall of, of Diamond Lil. So the only real difference in it is the position of the oil cooler. That's really the only difference in them. The being round and everything like that, that's standard for an A model B24. But the cowlings and all that stuff off the airplane today were put on in 1945, and those are straight off of a PBY Catalina. And the order to proceed on that was done around the 1st of August of 45. Next slide. And that's what the airplane looked like in its final configuration during the war with the military. You see, it still has AM927 printed on the tail fin instead of the original uh, 402366. The reason is the airplane still actually belongs to the British at this point. So that'll come into play here in a minute. Next slide. But what you can see in this slide is that they've gone away. Uh, so the greenhouse uh, uh, canopy type is gone. Now they've got the sliding long windows that uh, became much more kind of a trademark of the cockpit look of this airplane. So that was done really still during the war. Yeah, this was done in, in 1945, right towards the towards the end of the war. Okay. Uh, 11 October of 45, the British Aircraft Commission sent a letter to Consolidated at Consolidated's request saying that they could have the airplane. It was actually given to the consolidated. So it belonged to the British the entire war. So not only is it not true that the British never accepted it, the British actually kept it the entire war. They just never operated the airplane. It was actually given officially to, and we have the paperwork proving it, given back to consolidated as their own airplane at no cost. And uh, it's interesting of the 20 airplanes they bought, they received 19 of them. They never got an airplane to replace Diamond Lil. It was just kind of written off. On the 29th of November, they wrote a certification proposal for the CAA, the Civil Aer Aeronautics Commission. It's kind of the predecessor of the FAA. And this was in an effort to get the B-24 certified as a civilian airplane to get into the transport market at the end of the war. Next slide. And this airplane never left the United States during the war. As far as we can tell, it never did. It, it went back and forth from one factory location to another. And what it did, according to the logs, what it would carry parts. And then it would pick up a, like a crew that had ferried an airplane. It'd pick up the ferry crew 
and bring them back to the factory. And then it went back and forth. But I think when it was released by, by, by uh, consolidated, it had like 13,000 hours on it. I mean, they flew it a whole lot, but here it is in its first civilian markings when it's, went to continental can it's actually still registered to, to uh, consolidate it at this point but this is what it looked like when continental can originally purchased the airplane next slide and that's that's the bill of sale and it doesn't say under what they paid for it but see up there it says uh, aircraft make is that that you know third line on the left it says lb30 the airplane was still known as an lb30 and not a b24 again due to the serial number being AM927 because there was there was no warbird movement in 1947. Nobody cared if it was a B24 on paper or on data plate or whatever. It had an LB30 data plate because it was built that way. And that's why it stayed like this. But this is the bill of sale for Continental Can. Uh, next slide. This is what it looked like while in operation with Continental Can. Kind of the same as it did in the military, but at this point it had a much more plush interior. Next and slide. this is where it, where it gets a little confusing as to how it ends up at Continental Can. So what my dad always said, because my dad was familiar with the airplane, uh, really since 1945 on. I don't, and I don't know why or how, because it really shouldn't have fit into his scope of work uh, during the war. But he was really good friends with Lucius Clay. Um, so Lucius Clay. Uh, replaced Eisenhower as essentially a Supreme Allied Commander, but he, it, they called it something like uh, Occupying Governor or something like that. And he was stationed in Berlin after the war. And what I'm, Brad and I talked about this a little bit. What I'm guessing is, is that he had a C-87 assigned to him, an actual C-87 as his, um, as his airplane. And it, what I'm guessing is, is there was a C-87 that was uh, a presidential airplane. Uh, at, at one point, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt flew on that airplane, obviously. But then Avril Harriman, as the uh, ambassador to Russia, had a C-87 that was separate from the presidential one. And I'm guessing that that airplane might have ended up with Lucius Clay and that Lucius Clay had a, um, I think he liked uh, the C-87, and when he went over to work at Continental Can, that may have been why he wanted to pick up something that, even though this was technically an LB-30, he thought of it as a C-87. That's, what, what would you say, Brad, is that a good guess? Something? That's, that's as good as any as we can make. I think it's pretty reasonable. So, next slide. And this was, I don't have my glasses on. I can't remember what that was. Be quite honest. It was some. Oh, it was when they exported it to Mexico. This is when Continental Can sold the airplane to to Pimax, and uh, this is basically, this is where they're saying that it's coming off of the civil registry. So that was in 1959. It looks like so that's when the airplane was sold to Mexico. Yeah, and so th and again, this is where my dad is involved with this airplane because. He is uh, friends with Lucius Clay. Again, I'm not really sure where that connection came from, but they've been friends for a while. And Lucius Clay had called my dad and said, I think that it was kind of Ken was upgrading to a Jetstar. And so they wanted to sell uh, their LB-30. Their, uh, and my dad was very good friends with the head of Pemex at the time. And Pemex was looking for a long-range executive aircraft. And so that's how that sale happened, because my dad was in the middle of having it go from Continental Can to Pemex. Next slide. This is what the airplane looked like um, its last years with Pemex. This is after it came to the CAF. This is in Brownwood, Texas in 1967. And that, that picture, I should have put that next after this next one, but this is what it looked like when the CF bought it. You see, it has kind of the bulbous nose on the end of it. That's a weather radar that was put into the airplane. If you look at the previous pictures, it doesn't have that kind of a bulb tip on the nose. It just has a standard round nose. So at this point, it was an executive airplane that the CF had purchased. Uh, so, what, what, wait, wait, before you leave here, so what you see, if you look at the 
um, left uh, vertical uh, stabilizer there, it still has the XC designation, the Mexican registration on it. So this is very shortly after because it still has, has the Mexican registration numbers on it. Um, this airplane in 1959 when it was transferred to Pemex, uh, at my dad's recommendation, it was sent to Oklahoma and a new executive interior was put into it. Now, I don't know if they uh, redid what Continental Can had already put into it, uh, which I, I, it would be doubtful. I think they totally redid the interior of it. It was a beautiful executive interior of it. And that's why I was the, uh, I was born in November of 59. So somewhere in January of, of 1960s when I was a six week old baby flying on the airplane or maybe December, you know, probably Christmas week, uh, and flew from Mexico City to Acapulco in the airplane. Okay, next slide. This right here, if you, this is a letter to Lloyd Nolan, and this is in 1966, and this is from Vic Agatha, John's dad. If you see down there in the third paragraph, it says there's a beautiful C-87 located in Mexico uh, owned by Pemex. And that's where the CAF first learned of the airplane was from Vic Agather. And you see, he calls it a C-87 too, because being a military guy, he would have seen the cargo version of the airplane. And LB-30 probably didn't mean anything to him. It just looked like a C-87. And so that's kind of where the confusion on the airplane, the, uh, the first time it was confused, I guess, in CAF parlance. But that's the letter right there. That's the actual letter that introduced this airplane to the CAF. Next slide. And this is the agreement that the CAF made with Pemex to buy the airplane. And John can speak to this here in just a second. He's got a better version, a uh, better story of it than I do and better versions of the truth than me. Um, the airplane, we paid money for it. I can't remember the exact purchase price, but we also agreed that when the airplane came to the U.S., we would give them back the four engines that were on it because they still had a couple of C-47s at Pemex and they needed the engines. And the CAF, in, in true CAF style at the time, we knew we didn't have the money to pay for the engines. We didn't have the money to buy them. And I've got a letter from Lefty and Lloyd to some other supporters saying, if we ever take these engines off the airplane, it'll never fly again. But this is the agreement that we made to purchase the airplane and give the engines back. Next page. Yeah, so what I think is happening here is that there is actually not much money being exchanged, even though they may be claiming there's money being exchanged. And the reason I think that my dad's involvement was very quiet about the whole thing is because um, more than likely, uh, what was happening is that one of the intelligence services, and this happened a lot, um, particularly the CIA had a lot of airplanes, a whole lot of airplanes. So all the Bay of Pigs things had happened, and that really affected Fifi, actually, uh, because they were using um, A-26s that were um, CIA airplanes. And all of a sudden, that affected a, a lot of bomber fleet-type uh, transports in the United States. There was big restrictions put on them. And what I'm guessing it happened here is that my dad had an arrangement uh, through, through the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, probably, to exchange... Um, I'm not sure about the engines, but there was a DC-6 that was involved in the exchange for, uh, for Diamond Lil. Uh, and um, my dad was always pretty cryptic about it. He, I know that he was right in the middle of, of the whole thing because uh, he was involved with it going to Continental Can and Continental Can to Pemex and then from Pemex to CAF. He knew that airplane for a long, long time. And, and truly, um, you know, the CAF probably could not have afforded to buy this outright as a as an airplane because it was a beautiful executive transport, probably still desirable by many corporations at that point. So whatever the finagling was that was being done there, uh, there was probably some involvement in the U.S. government wanting to get it, make sure that it was uh, affected. Okay, next slide. When the CAF got the airplane they sent the mexican mechanics and, and the pmx crew back home with all the tools and crates and everything like that and said they made a deal with them and said we will get you some engines and there's differing accounts on how this happened i've got receipts and paperwork 
proving that the CAF went on a hunt for engines. And I think Pemex eventually agreed to take two good engines and two overhaul the course two that could be overhauled so still a total of four engines but it was still you know only two were good but it was still more money than the cf had and so timex kept the books and registration and paperwork for the airplane until the caf managed to cough up the four engines and they did this one engine came from oklahoma one from california they kind of cobbled them from around the country and how exactly they got paid for is 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 up for debate it, it's can be under nefarious circumstances but either way, in the dark of night, a CF crew went down to Mexico, down to the border with a truck with four engines on it. And the Pemex people met them at the border with a customs guy and they traded the paperwork for the airplane for the truck with the engines. And that was in 1968. The CF officially bought the airplane in 1967. And that's reflected in all of our paperwork. But if you look at the FAA paperwork and everything, and a lot of books and magazines that will say we got the airplane in 68. That's because that's when we finally were able to get the paperwork away from Pemex and couldn't register the airplane prior to that. So you can see in this picture what they were doing. This was in this was in 1968 uh, is when this uh, ad came out. They were going to the Dayton Air Show and the CAF put out this little flyer in the dispatch magazine or the newsletter time. It said, if you'd like to fly to Dayton, first come, first serve. And I think it was like, like $130 or something to ride round trip to Dayton, Ohio. And there was uh, 12 seats in the plane or something like that. But this is what the airplane looked like. The exact, this is the interior that I know for certain is Diamond Lil. There are some other interior shots that I think are Diamond Lil, but I can't say for certain they are. That one I know is. And if you look in the picture to the left, you see Lefty Gardner there on the left side. And the panel's all, uh, you know, equipped pretty nice. Uh, the airplane had radar, it had radios, all that kind of stuff. Within just a few years of coming to the CF, most of that stuff disappeared. The radios were all pulled out and put into the fighters and stuff like that. So the airplane kind of kind of got neglected. It wasn't abused, but it kind of got treated badly uh, to get the fighters going later on. You know, what's interesting about this picture, well, first of all, Lefty was a B-24 pilot during the war. So it makes sense that he'd be flying the airplane. The fellow sitting on the right sure looks like Van Skiles, but I can't speak to that being. Uh, yeah, but, um, this is the interior that I remember. And now that I look at the picture carefully, when I first saw this picture the other day when Brad sent it to me, I was like, yeah, but it doesn't have the panoramic window. So if you look at the picture above, under the wing, you see that long panoramic window with the two uh, windows behind it, smaller windows. But if you look at this picture now that I'm looking at it, where if you look at the two forward seats, the club configuration seats, the four seats facing each other, that is the panoramic window. So this is the interior of, Dime, uh, of what was the Pemex interior of, of this airplane. It was a beautiful airplane. I mean, the interior was really first class. It was nice. The, the joke by all the flight crews during the early years of operating this was it was so nice on the inside. They didn't know if they needed to be wearing flight suits or dinner jackets because it was such a nice airplane. They said, you could have put a tuxedo on and, and felt at home in the airplane. Yeah. Next slide. So around 1972, when Transpo 72 was going to happen, which is a big transportation conference up in D.C., the CAF was invited to bring their entire fleet up to uh, up to D.C. and fly over the Potomac and fly over the Capitol and all that. And uh, Fifi didn't get to go, but they, they made a very concerted effort to try to get Fifi's one-time flight restriction removed so that she could go. She wasn't able to, but die. And this is when the CAF first put authentic paint or military paint on their airplanes. And this is an ad for Charlie Day aircraft refinishers out of San Angelo. And Charlie painted all the original CAF airplanes. And this is what Diamond Little looked like. You see, it still has the radar nose there on the right. That's when the airplane was first painted in, mar in uh, military markets. Next slide. I, I went to Transpo 72. I was there for that. Um, and Charlie was a prince of a guy. I'll just add that. He was a, a neat guy. This picture of uh, Fifi on the left, though, that is uh, not 72. That's in 73. I mean, that's, yeah, that's in uh, 74. Uh, yeah. But Charlie is the guy that painted uh, Fifi. And, yeah. But in 72, Fifi still looked, didn't have a name yet. It wasn't named Fifi yet. And it yeah. still was what it looked like coming out of the desert in 69. Uh, yeah. But I do remember when they, they painted Diamond Lil. Yeah. Okay, next slide. 
And this this is what Diamond Lil looked like for several years down in Harlingen. You know, and I, and I said that the airplane wasn't really neglected. It just kind of suffered at the hands of some of the other planes. It was used as a spare part source for a lot of the other airplanes that were really popular to fly. And part of the problem was um, no one really knew what it was. It was kind of a B-24, but it had this executive interior in it. And I've got a, I've got a, a letter that a guy wrote to headquarters in 1976, I guess it was, where he was just maddered and fired because he had paid a dollar to tour the airplane. And he had flown B-24s during the war, and that was not a B-24. No B-24 he ever was in had a bar in it. And he was mad. And so the CF, that's when they first said, we need to look at converting this back to a bomber. And it's a little known fact, and we would never admit to it today, but I'll tell the secret because I have the paperwork to back it up. The CAF tried a couple of different times early in Diamond Lil's career with the CF. They tried a couple of different times to trade it for other airplanes that were flyable bomber configured airplanes. I have the letters that they wrote to the Air Force trying to train Jade Drisland for the D model that's on display at Dayton. Uh, they tried to trade it for the J model that is on display at the Pima Air Museum because that airplane had flown in from England. They made several uh, attempts to to get another plane. They were going to rebuild this for static for those museums, but they wanted an actual bomber and they just didn't have it. Next slide. So that's what the airplane flew with. You see now it's got a the bomber nose on it. And that's the original A model slash D model stop, uh, style nose glass on it. The nose glass actually came from a man named David Talashe out in California. He had found a couple of B-24s that had been scrapped up in Canada and they were put on train cars and brought back to California, to Barstow. And he was going to rebuild at least one flying D model out of there. Well, there was a mistake somehow and the guys that unloaded the planes unloaded them on the side of the track where the scrap yard was. And so the, those two B-24s, they got scrapped. And about the only thing left was part of the nose and that's for this nose glass cut. And the CF traded a uh, uh, P-38 nose for that nose. That's where Diamond Lil got that. Next slide. And that's that's the, the nose art. That's from 1978. That's pretty much the original nose art that was on it. There was about three or four different versions of it over the years, but it's a, it's a uh, Alberto Vargas drawing from like 1966, I think it was. It appeared in Playboy magazine, and that's where that art actually came from. The name Diamond Lil. There was a movie, a, a play that turned into a movie called May West, uh, was starring May West. And she was a madam in a house of ill repute in the old West. And that's what the whole premise of the movie was. It was a musical and her name was Diamond Lil. And there was also a country song about it called D Darling Diamond Lil. That's where the name came from. Um, she is not named after a prostitute. I've heard that story normal times. A movie prostitute, yes, but it wasn't named after anyone specific. It was apparently named after the movie character that, uh, that uh, Mae West played. Uh, next slide. <laughs> So before we get into this, John, is there anything you wanted to say about flying in the airplane back when it was an executive yeah. configuration? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, not only was it the first airplane I ever flew in as a, as a baby, um, and I'm not sure how my dad swung this because uh, you were not supposed to fly in CAF airplanes unless you were um, at least 18 years old. But I remember flying in Fifi in 1973 to the air show that was at Dallas at Southwest, the uh, the um, the airport. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but there was uh, an airport called Southwest uh, that was in between Dallas and Fort Worth. And CAF flew an air show there that Diamond Lil was part of. But I flew up there with my mom and uh, I had brought with me some Coca-Cola's. And my mom had brought with her a case of rum that my dad would always hand out to all the CAF guys. That was this rum from Mexico that they all loved, Ron Castillo. And then the, there were three guys from the CAF that were just hopping a ride. They were not crew, and they had an ice chest. And so between the three of us, we all configured. And uh, it's the first place I started drinking uh, rum and cokes. And it's the first place I ever got drunk was on that airplane. I'm a little too young to be doing that, but I didn't know any better. Uh, so that was my last uh, first and last ride uh, uh, as, as kind of a conscious adult in that airplane. 
uh, with the executive configuration. Yeah. In the uh, over the years, Diamond Lil has has um, had kind of ups and downs from a maintenance perspective. They had different times where you had crews that worked really hard on the airplane for a few years, then the money ran out or they couldn't get air shows or, you know, financial trouble or whatever. And then it would set for a few years and then it would get back up and fly a few more years. And that happened quite a bit. And then finally in the nineties, it, uh, it wound up mid to late nineties. It wound up in Tulsa with a group of CF members and, and guys like, uh, uh, Jim Gentry and Matt Olofsson and Bob Prater and Shad Morris. Uh, they and a whole bunch of guys. They had a really good crew of most of American airline guys that really did a lot of work to this airplane. And a, a guy named Fred Kumpf is the guy who's kind of unknown in the CAF. Uh, I said at the beginning of this that I get to stand on the back of a lot of people who have done research. Well, Fred Kumpf went out to consolidated their archives in San Diego, and he's the one who dug up the vast majority of the paperwork that proves where this airplane came from. The original bill of sale, which we had the window sticker for the plane. We've got that. Fred Kumpf is the guy who dug this up and no one had ever gone to the trouble to do that before. And that's why so many books were printed with just hearsay in them, because it wasn't until the mid to late nineties that anyone actually found out the truth. So we've had the airplane since now. And here it is 2020. And every time I open another box of B24 stuff, we learn something else about this airplane. How is it you can own an airplane for 50 years and still find something else about its history every day? But we do with this with this airplane. But the guys in Tulsa, you know, they really did a lot of work to this airplane. It flew to the UK one summer and did a couple of air shows. And uh, they really put a lot of work into it. And then over the years, we had the big engine problems with Fifi and everything where we had to ground the airplane for four years. And Diamond Lil being part of B-29 and B-24 Squadron, it was kind of up to Diamond Lil to really support us financially from an air show perspective. So the decision was made as much as possible to convert the airplane back to its original bomber configuration. And a guy named Gary Austin was the crew chief at the time. And Gary is the one who, with, with some volunteers, but a lot of it was Gary and the high sky wing guys at Midland who did a lot of the fabric work and all, they're the ones that converted this airplane into what you see today. If you see there on the, the picture on the left, you see this B-24 being so early, it's not like B-24s that people think about. It doesn't have a gun to, you know, a big round gun turret in the back like the others do. It has a guy who sits in a canvas sling in that drawing right there, and he hangs out the back of the airplane with either one or two machine guns, depending on the configuration. Uh, next slide. Well, Diamond Lil didn't have a gun tub in the back. It had a, a cargo pod on the back of the airplane. So Gary Austin, he had to figure out how to make a non-existent gun turret with hardly any drawings and very few pictures. And you see up there in the left, that's a, a Spanish built Heinkel, the H-111 Heinkel. The CF had a lot of spare parts for a Heinkel they used to own. And you see on the right, there's a, a damaged spinner. Well, we found that out on, on the hill, as we called it in Midland, there were all the spare parts were, and you see that it had a big dent in it, so it was never gonna be airworthy. The bottom part of the tail turret of Diamond Lil is actually a Heinkel spinner that Gary cut in half and then sectioned and beat it into, into, into position and ran it on an English wheel. And he built that gun tub from scratch, starting with, with the Heinkel spinner. So I like to put that slide in there so people know that's that's where that came from. That shows the genius that people like Gary Austin have to make something out of nothing. Next slide. Gary was meticulous too. He wanted oh, to make sure everything was as historically accurate as possible. Yep. And you see, this is what the gun turret ended up being, and that is authentic for a for a A model B twenty four. Next slide. The airplane didn't have a ball turret on the bottom like a lot of people think. Later model B-24s did, but even the first series of the D model still didn't have it. So Diamond Lil had a 50 cal that went in a socket and stuck out the bottom of the airplane. It was called a tunnel gun. And some of that structure was still there, but Gary had to build the entire door and everything, but the mounts were still there. So Gary constructed all of that from scratch with some help from some other volunteers. Next slide. And that's what it looks like from the bottom. And you can see Fifi over there in the background with the nose case off the engine. This is when we didn't have the money to fix the engines yet. We hadn't even started taking the old engines off. But that's when Gary put the gun back in the belly of it. Next slide. I remember this because when I was in charge of redoing the um, 
the engines for Fifi, uh, I was always amazed at what he was doing with Diamond Lil because he always had something going on with with oh, Diamond yeah. Lil. And he did it with no money. They we did it with no money. He did it with spare parts, you know, that we found. Um, one thing that we haven't ever gone back to is if you look on the left side, right behind the wheel, you see that little ladder sticking down the belly. That's how you got into the A model B24. Well, nowadays, people being a little bigger than your average 120 pound American, uh, we knew that it wasn't practical for people to get in, <laughs> for people to get in and out of there. Well, the airplane had a cargo door cut into the side of it when it was converted. And that comes into play later. That's where the left waist window would have been originally, waist gun window. And all the control cables originally ran down the side of the airplane. All that was reconfigured when they put the cargo door to run over the top. So we knew that cargo door wouldn't work. So the next slide will show you kind of what we And that, that door that you see on the right, that is the, that's the door that, that it had, uh, probably even a consolidated, uh, but it's definitely the Pemex door. And then they yeah. had a little set of ladder, a little set of stairs that they would take with them that then they would put out. And that's what you, you know, walked out on. Okay, next slide. That's what Gary did. He took that door and basically cut it by three quarters. And so now we have kind of an air stair door. As a result, we don't have the waste window on the left side where the waste gunner would be. But until we have the time and the money to completely reconfigure the control cables, which is a massive undertaking, we probably won't be able to ever undo this. Next slide. And when Gary did this and I saw what he was doing, I just said, I'm just shocked that in the corporate conversions of this airplane, that some somebody didn't think about doing that. Uh -huh. And you see the right waist window, the structure was still there. Gary just had to uncover it and find it. So now it has a waist gun on the right side. Next slide. This is this is the airplane that's in the Air Force Museum. This is a standard D model with the oval cowling and all that. But see where the top turret is right there behind the cockpit? That's what most people assume a top turret on the B-24 looks like. So next slide. But I want you to notice too, see this airplane, if you go back a second, take a look at the top of, of, of that cockpit and you see the greenhouse, all the glass that's up on top there. Um, so Diamond Lil uh, had that taken out long ago. I mean, probably during the war, right, Gary? Yeah, during the war conversion, it did. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide. You see in the drawing on the left, the gunner actually had an open ring like the tail gunner of an SPD Dauntless or a Helldiver. And he stood up there on a, on a platform and fired an open through an open hole. And you see the hole is still in the airplane. The ring is still there, but the control cables are ran through it. This is aft of the wing. So this airplane never had a, a top gun, top turret like people think. Next slide. And you can see in this picture with it circled, this is one of the sister ships that did go to the UK. You can see the gun sticking out of the top of no turret. Later on, the British did put a turret in there. And then eventually the turret moved up to the front where people, you know, historically associated. Next slide. The Bombay doors, we do have about 80% of the stuff we need to put Bombay doors back in the airplanes. The external tracks are still there hidden underneath the sheet metal. We've got the doors, we have bomb racks. The airplane actually has some racks in it. It could be done. Uh, it would be a major, major ordeal. You'd have to jig the airplane up and, and take that canoe back out and put a, a keel beam back in. It is possible. And if somebody wants to mail a check for a million dollars, to the squadron, uh, we'd be happy to get the Bombay's back in, but we could potentially do that. Next slide. Um, when the airplane was finished, they they kind of thought let's rebrand it, and it, the plane never had a, a real name. They called it Old Nine Two Seven during the war sometimes, but it never really had nose art or anything other than Diamond Lil. And since Diamond Lil wasn't historically accurate, they thought, well, let's just for marketing, let's make another name. Let's name it something else. And this is really pushed a lot by Gary. And uh, so they did it. That's where they took the nose art off in preparation for painting plank. Next well, slide. And what's happening at this this time, exactly when this is happening, is that the Collings Foundation B24 is coming online and it's being rebranded several times. It was called the All-American, then Dragging the Tail, and I don't even know what it's called today, but uh, that was the, the thinking as well. Maybe we need to rebrand and, and go to something else. Yep. 
Next slide. This is when the airplane was painted back in British markets. Remember I said earlier that the black paint used to go all the way to the top. The reason that wasn't done is because it makes the airplane so much hotter. That's the reason they left the black all the way down at the bottom. Next slide. A very talented artist named Chad Hill came down and he painted the new name and nose art on the airplane and it became old 927. And this is when he was actually, I took, was actually painting. Next slide. Which I think old 927 was a Gary Austin uh, pull, wasn't it? It, it? He's the one who really pushed it the hardest. There is, there is some documentation where they refer to the airplane when Consolidated was operated it is old 927. Well, I was in the Air Force for 20 years and flew most of my career, and we referred to all airplanes by their tail numbers unless they had, you know, a specific name. So I don't think the airplane was never named old 927 historically. They just called it that. But Gary and, well, and several not, other people thought that would be a good way to go with a new name for it in those are What he told me was that he had seen uh, some piece of paperwork mm -hmm. when it was in San Diego being uh, uh, retrofitted or fixed up that it was referred to as, uh, oh, yeah, we call that airplane old 927. That's how he came yeah. up with it. That was in a newspaper article in 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 the the company newspaper. I've got that somewhere here at the house that, that Gary gave me. Uh, so this is what the airplane looked like when it's finished, and we flew it like that for a couple of years. Uh, next slide. And then in 2012, the squadron voted. Uh, I was in the vote when they did it. It was not. It was overwhelming. It, it you know not everyone voted for it, but it's overwhelmingly voted to go back to Diamond Lil. The reason being was that we were constantly faced with question, where'd Diamond Lil go? What happened to Diamond Lil? And the airplane was famous for being Diamond Lil, just like Fifi is not famous for being a B-29. Specifically, it's famous for being Fifi. But, and same thing with Diamond Lil. It's, its history as a warbird is what has made the airplane well known. So we went back to Diamond Lil and uh, I don't, you know, Gary Velasco did the nose art and it's a little updated from the original, but it looks very nice and it's been very successful. Next slide. And that's what the airplane looks like when we rolled it out the doors over there at over here at Addison uh, when it was kept here at the museum. Uh, we rolled it out and uh, started touring the airplane and did so very successfully. It had a very good um, response from the public. And we now we get a few questions every year. What happened to old 927? Did, it, you know, did someone sell it or what? The airplane will probably stay just like that in that configuration. Um, as far as going back 100% like it left the factory, we could never go back to the short nose, even if we do have a short nose to do it with. But even if we could, we wouldn't do it because of the stability issues. The Bombay, it's a million dollar job to do that. So it'll probably never happen. Um, the airplane still struggles. It makes money, but it struggles to make as much money as it could because it's not a B-17, quite honestly. B-17s are so popular and the poor B-24 still suffers in comparison. But Diamond Lil is a, an exceptional airplane and the people that maintain it now the volunteers in particular that really work hard on this airplane have just, they just bust their tails keeping it going. And even when they are met with, you know, problems that are difficult and in this case today expensive because of the coronavirus canceling air shows and everything, they still find a way to do it. And so the airplane desperately needs an influx of cash. And so if anybody wants to send us a check, we're happy to take it and, and put it into the airplane. Well, I'll make a couple of comments about um, the B-24 and why uh, the post-war uh, conservation of these airplanes versus the B-17. Uh, so B-17 is a far easier airplane to fly uh, than the B-24. Uh, I have a lot of respect for the guys that flew this airplane during the war when it was uh, at Max Gross or beyond that. Um, it it's a tricky airplane to fly. Um, you know, I remember a long time ago when, when I was flying it, I said, well, this airplane really doesn't take off. It departs and it doesn't land, it arrives. Because uh, you're, you're just not quite sure exactly as you're coming in. And it's had nose gear collapse uh, issues in the past. And part of that, I think, is because it's, it's a very hard airplane to put into a nose-up configuration uh, for landing. Uh, I mean, you can do it. It's just, it's a trick. And so the guys during the war that were doing it, go, go look at wartime footage of, of a B-24 departing anywhere. And you will see that it, it kind of 
goes up like an elevator. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't go up like a B-29. You definitely have rotation and, and the airplane is, is uh, nose up as it's going off. B-24 theoretically is supposed to do that, but it's a little trickier to do it. And um, it, it, that's probably one of the reasons why it didn't have quite the popularity after the war that a B-17 did, because a B-17 was just a far easier airplane to fly. Having said that, um, there's a lot of firsts that happen with B-24s, particularly at Willow Run for the Ford Motor Company, because they, they produced a boatload of these airplanes at Willow Run and discovered mass production techniques that were then transferred to the B-29, to, to Boeing. Uh, so that they would know how to do things uh, because Ford Motor Company was a mass production company. They knew how to do this. Yep. And I do remember and when this airplane transferred over to the B-29 squadron, it was struggling financially. And the mm -hmm. truth is that it's been a great symbiotic relationship between Diamond Lil and Fifi, uh, sometimes touring together, sometimes having to support each other when the other one was down uh, so that they would be both financially viable. Okay. Next slide. And that's what she looks like today. And I guess, and if I had one final, a couple of final things to say about this is what I want people to take and spread far and wide and tell whenever people cast aspersions on this airplane, it is not and never was a C-87. It was started as a B-24A, sold to the British and became a LB-30, flew that way, became a civilian airplane and is kind of a cross between a B-24A and LB-30. But the number one thing to know is an LB-30 does not mean cargo version of the B-24 Liberator. LB-30 means nothing but British export designation for a B-24. No LB-30 came off of the factory floor as a cargo plane. It just happens that a few of them, including this one, were converted to cargo planes later on. LB-30 is nothing more than the export name for a B-24A. So anyone who tells you a B-24, it's not a B-24, it's LB-30, they're just being a smart aleck and trying to prove they know more than you. At the end of the day, it is a B-24. It walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. And in this case, it really does waddle going down the taxiway. There, and they're really, truly, there are not many models of B-24s, period, static ones, that you can go look at. Uh, the only one that I've ever been through that is actually fairly stock is owned by Kermit Weeks that I think he got out of India, if I'm not mistaken. And it still has pretty much everything in it that, that came out of it with the war. Uh, there's, I've seen the one that's at, at uh, in England, uh, obviously uh, the one that's at the Air Force Museum. There's, there's just not a whole ton of them. Uh, they were destroyed. Yeah, you had 18,000 of these things built. There's two that fly. And then if you count Kermit's Weeks airplane, that's the third one that could potentially fly again. But other than that, there will probably never, ever be another B-24 ever fly besides Diamond Lil and the Collins Foundation airplane. We're lucky to have it. And, and uh, I hope we can fly it for a lot longer. Hope we can. Agree. Nancy? Wow. That was a lot of information. I'm so glad we've got this recorded because I think I need to go back and take a bunch of notes from it. But thank you, Brad. Thank you, John. That was really informative. And I know our audience has a lot of questions. So I'm going to have Leah jump in here with the long list of things that have been coming in during your, your talk to see uh, if, if you guys don't mind taking a few more minutes just to answer some questions for us. So Leah, have you got any any uh, questions that have come in from our audience? We have a lot of questions that are coming in. We have a very large audience today full of people who, Gary Velasco is on, who painted the nose art. We've got Al Benzi. We've got a lot of people on. So if you have a question that these guys can't answer, you should ask it and we can get it to somebody else because we've got quite a number of people on. Very impressive crowd. Um, but the first question that we got is, what's the difference between flying a B-29 and a B-24? Um, well, I will say, I mean, but the B-29 just has so much more power. And, and uh, particularly Fifi uh, is now so much lighter than its wartime uh, configuration. I think that the B-29, uh, if I were going to say, how do you compare that airplane? 
it, it's really kind of the first modern uh, large scale, large aircraft. In other words, pressurized, uh, high altitude bomber. Not to say the P twenty four was also what didn't have the thirty five thousand service ceiling, Brad, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and B twenty nine was thirty seven thousand. The difference between B twenty four and B twenty nine that way, though, is that the guys that are flying those B seventeens, the B twenty fours, they're having to to wear um, these fleece lined electrically. Uh, heated suits because they're flying up to these below zero altitudes, uh, whereas the B-29 was a shirt sleeves airplane. So from that standpoint, the B-29 was a much more comfortable airplane to fly uh, just because you didn't have to have all the, the gear that, that went with it. In my opinion, the B-24 is a, is, is kind of a tricky airplane to fly. It, it's, it's honest if you know how to fly a B-24. Uh, and it, 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 that's why the training for that was in the early days that I remember when a really great gentleman, a fellow named Ronnie Gardner, spent a lot of time with that airplane. And he made damn sure that anybody who was flying that airplane really knew what they were doing. Um, and the B-29 obviously has had a, a whole coterie of really good professional people flying it. Brad, do you want to add to that? I mean, do you know? I've never flown the B-24. I've flown the B-29 facing backwards in the engineer's chair. So I don't <laughs> I would think the B-29 is easier to fly. Those that love, like the B-24 really like it. Those that don't, uh, it's kind of like uh, talking about your sister. You can do it, but nobody else can. So those that love the B-24 really do, and those that don't, just don't. But just take a look at the wings on a B-17 versus a B-24. B-24 is this very long, thin, critical wing. Uh, it made it faster. There's a lot of advantages that went with it, uh, but it just, it's just trickier. Uh, in my opinion. Okay. Um, the next question we had is: Is the, was the B twenty four ever considered to be used as a strategic atomic bomber because it had a better range of payloads than the B seventeen? No. The only other airplane during World War II that ever seriously was considered was the Lancaster. But the logistics of getting a Lancaster away from the British and to the Americans without telling everybody what was happening. There, there was just the logistics of it just made it impossible. So that was never even looked at seriously. The B-24, because the airplane sits so low to the ground and the way the bomb bay doors open and all that, the B-29, you had to load the bomb into a pit and then raise it into the airplane. Practically, I don't think they ever even considered the B-24 because you just physically couldn't get it in there. And you also had that, you know, the B-29 was a full width, uh, width bomb bay from right to left. The B-24, kind of like the B-17, had to catwalk down the center. The B-29 has the catwalks on the outboard edges. So the opening was much larger. Even if you just used one bomb bay, the, the bomb wouldn't have fit in the B-24. There was no way to get it in there. And we didn't say it at the last seminar, but Fifi actually came to Harlingen with atomic bomb racks in it. And uh, somebody uh, showed up at Harlingen one day was going to cut the main spar uh, because it had these uh, very antiquated, but uh, they were the original uh, uh, A-bomb bomb racks. And they got a hold of my dad and he put a stop to that real quickly. Uh, but they had to they had to dismantle the original a bomb racks out of uh, Fifi uh, in order to get a uh, type certificate or uh, to get the no flight clause removed. Yeah. And one question is: Is Dynamo the only B twenty four on the rides program? No, the Col the Collins Foundation airplane has been doing rides for twenty five years, probably as long as they've had the airplane. They're not currently doing rides right now. But uh, if they ever start back up again, I'm, I'm certain there will be 24 and ours both will still be doing rides. And I've ridden in both of them, and I would encourage people who have the opportunity, ride in whichever one you can. I'd prefer you spend your money with us, but don't pass up the opportunity to ride a B-24 should it present itself. Okay, and I'm looking for um, Robert Prater is on the call, and he is from um, Oklahoma, and he had a question that was, harder for me to even ask. So I'm going to take him, as soon as I can find him, I'm going to take him off mute so that he can ask his question. Robert, if you're there, if you'll raise your hand, that will help me find you. Like I said, we've got a lot of people on the call today. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. Is there any questions that you guys had that you wanted to ask to some of our audience members? 
Hey, Brad. Hey, yeah. and John, Nancy. This uh, this is Robert Prater. I'm the uh, I'm a life member hey, of the state. Currently, the unit leader up in uh, Tulsa. Yeah. And uh, had the fortune. I was had the great fortune to get work get to work with Jim Gentry and and no Fred Kumpf and all those guys. And I tell you, Fred was that guy was the uh, he was the guru on research. I mean, he was engineer by trade. So he found a lot of material for us. I know uh, there should be somewhere in the CF headquarters, there was a whole box of microfilm to, of the B24A that I think I sent down. I purchased that and sent that down there. And I think I got a do bunch of documentation for you, the packing list and supplier's invoice and all that stuff. Yeah. So one of the things, I don't know how we can find, one of the things that we were always trying to find, you know, because I always, you know, I see stuff that you post on Facebook and I do you know, every once in a while, somebody will, kind of put some some myth you know those these myths will keep popping up and right. so we'll try to put these fires out and i'll see you answer i'll answer every once in a while but yeah. you know one of the things one of the things and i don't know how we're going to find it was originally whoever came up with the lb30 designation for this airplane because it was a b24 on the line but then right. for whatever reason the paperwork shows up as an lb30 so that's one piece of paperwork we probably need to find somewhere that the u.s government said to the british government you know, hey, we'll 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 classify this as an LB30 to sell it to you. The yes. other one, the other stuff we've never been able to find. I don't know how we're going to find it. And I, I've tried, you know, uh, obviously flying into Albuquerque with the airlines is somebody somewhere will have a picture of this airplane on her belly on the ground in Albuquerque. Yep. Somehow. I don't know how we can find that because um, yep. I think it'll also have that paint scheme. You know, the bomber command paint scheme had black all the way up the sides. I know there were six YB-24s that had, it was black on the bottom, but then had a green and green and brown up the fuselage. And, and if memory serves, when Gary was painting the airplane, that was the, that was the colors he decided to come up with, yeah. only because the airplane wasn't going to be so hot in, in Texas. Right. And, and the part that you were talking about earlier about needing something to prove when the LB-30 name came along, the only thing that I've ever found is I have found where there is a lot of B-24s that are... It, it talks about 20 B-24s being assigned to the RAF and it doesn't say serial numbers. It doesn't say anything. It doesn't say we're changing names. It just says a lot of 24 or 20 B-24s are going to the RAF. And then the next, the earliest paperwork that we have, and this isn't some of the stuff that Fred got that I've acquired. Um, it's never listed anywhere in consolidated paperwork that I have as a B-24. It's listed strictly as an LB-30. And somewhere the airplane, we don't know at what stage it was in construction when, when the contract was finalized for the British, but it's some part of that airplane started the production line as a B-24 because right. timing wise, it had to have, I'm just going to, someday I'm just going to have to go out to San Diego and dig through their archives. I know Fred spent a lot of time trying to find that and, and never could. And, and unfortunately at the time, the squadron didn't have the money to send him out there and have him right. continue it. But that's why I went through that list of guys in Tulsa, including you and, and Jim and Chad and, and Fred, because y'all don't get enough credit. You know, sometimes history tends to forget people. And that's why I wanted to make sure y'all's names got included in this because y'all started, but Gary and others have been lucky enough to continue. And y'all continued what was started by, you know, Dick Disney and people who flew it back in the sixties. And, and uh, the airplane would not be in the shape it's in today. If, if you guys in Tulsa hadn't have done all y'all had. And y'all never got enough credit for that, in my opinion. Okay, and only the just the last two things for you. Um, the the uh, history program we, we put together, I think, in the mid two thousands. Do you have a copy of that? I think I've actually posted probably, it on Facebook. Yeah, I probably do. I've got some of the logbooks. The other guys that flew the ones right after this one, I've got all of that stuff. So I probably have the history that y'all put together. Because one of those one of the cool pictures I think for the presentation you put together, AM nine two three. That was uh, Lil's uh, sister airplane, uh, four airplanes in front of her. There's actually a picture that we got from a guy named Desmond Isted. He flew for Coastal Command. He flew Liberators for Coastal Command, the RAF. He, yeah. uh, he, he was awarded two U-boat kills in World War II, and then he got his third after the war. But he actually gave us a picture of AM-923's cockpit with the uh, trigger on the aircraft commander's control stick. Right. 
with yeah, the guns. Yeah, I've got that picture, and I've and I've got the copies of his log books too. And the the neat yeah. thing about that picture, and we we should have put it in here. It doesn't look like a B twenty four cockpit, like you think of it. it has throttles, kind of like a B seventeen does. The H style throttles has the gun sight on the windshield and everything. Right. Uh, Diamond Lil, had she not gone to be a trainer purely by luck, it looks like. Had she not become a trainer, that's the configuration that airplane would have would have continued on as. Yep. Are no the plan. throttles that are on it are now the original throttles? No, no, when it was when it had the RY3 nose put on it, it took an RY3 cockpit. The yokes that originally it had the circular yokes like the PBY Catalina has, and uh, it's a totally different cockpit. It doesn't even look the same. Four engines, and, four engine gauges. That's the only similarity. And the last last thing I got for you, and I'll bail out is. Uh, I've never, I know we had to, we had to overhaul the oil tanks. I think it was in 2004 yep. or five. Yep. Um, and I know we, we saw data plates on the oil tanks that said B24A, yep. although yes. I can't find a picture of that. Do you have a picture of that somewhere? I, I do have a picture of that somewhere. In fact, I think I sent it to you the other night, John, possibly. But yeah, there was data plates on the oil tanks that said B24A. So. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to get a picture of that if, if I can eventually, but I'll touch base yeah, with I'll you. I'll see if I can find that for you. All right. Thanks a lot. I will, I will you. add that the, this airplane also, uh, when it was the Pemex airplane, was a presidential aircraft as a standby as well. Uh, the, it was a DC-6, and then uh, the, C, the, the, the Diamond Lil as a Pemex airplane would fly the president as well. Yep. Okay, so we... Speaking of, of going on tour, we had a question from someone that is asking about Diamond Lil's trip to the UK in 1992. Uh -huh. um, yeah, the is there any video about that? Um, I've never seen video. I've got all the log sheets and everything when they, when they uh, you know, crap track of their time and their fuel burning all going across. Um, I've seen a lot of pictures from the couple of air shows that they made in England. The problem was on the way over, I believe it was in Greenland, they had an engine failure, or it may have actually been when they first got to the UK. I can't, but at some point before they actually got all the way, they had an engine that had to be changed. And so that caused them to be late on their schedule and they and they missed several of the shows that they intended to do. So it kind of had an abbreviated state. I've never seen video, I don't think, but I have seen pictures of it flying like at Boscombe Down and places like that. It was supposed to be a more uh, a lengthier tour than what it ended up being, but the maintenance trouble got in the way. And I'm not positive about this, but I, I think the B-29 that is at Duxford now that you see in the American uh, section at Duxford, uh, the, the museum there, um, that would that B-29 was sitting in the desert uh, either next to or nearby Fifi. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a that's one of the China Lake B-29s. And the B-24 that they have there was actually the B-24 that was on the parade grounds at Lackland here yep. for a long, long time. And they got it and, and they, and that, that, so both those airplanes uh, were um, stateside here for a long, long time. Yeah, the B-29 flew over there, a guy named Skip Krieger and a guy named Don Davidson, not the same Don Davidson that used to work on Fifi, but Skip Krieger and Don Davidson flew that airplane from China Lake all the way to England. And then the B-24 that was at Lackland was the last B-24 still in service with the Air Force. And when it retired, it became a, uh, on the parade ground there. And then it was traded for a Spitfire and a fiberglass replica. And the Liberator that's on the parade ground at Lackland today is fiberglass. The other one that left and went to the UK has been restored to static and is sitting there at the B-29. And both airplanes have been fully restored and they're absolutely gorgeous. And it, just to add one last thing, this is inside CAF history, but uh, the B-25 that is uh, at the Lackland Parade Ground is the original B-25 of the CAF's Rowdy's Raider, which was traded uh, uh, for the twin Mustang we had because they had two, because there's another twin Mustang at, uh, yep. uh, but in those days they didn't catalog things very well, so. No, but it was very much gentleman's I'm agreement. I'm old enough to remember when all that happened. <laughs> yeah. All right, we have one last question, and it's kind of a big one, so I'll let you guys address it the way that you want to. But um, because these aircraft were not built to last, um, so maintenance is is like a whole nother animal entirely when it comes to maintaining these aircraft. 
Can you give the audience an idea of what some of the biggest obstacles maintaining the aircraft are? Maybe what some of the big costs associated with the aircraft um, and, and what it really takes to keep these large, heavy bombers flying. Well, first of all, anything with, with, you know, with the right amount of money and time applied can be made to last forever virtually. Um, there's no reason why Fifi or Diamond Lil couldn't fly at the age of 150. There's no practical reason why they couldn't, unless you consider millions of dollars to be the practical reason. The biggest expense is obviously operating costs because they're just so immensely expensive to fly just on an hour hourly basis. In the case of Diamond Lil, um, because it is, you know, because it started out as one type of airplane and then over years had a different nose added to it. And at one point it had a hydraulic accumulator out of a B-17 installed in it because that actually worked better than the original one did. So there's a lot of things on the B-24 that are not actual B-24 parts. And when you have one like Diamond Lil, that's actually two different B-24s put together. It's the front end of a later model B-24 on the back end of a, of a airplane that's totally different than the, the other B-24. Right now, we're having trouble with the gear trunnions. You know, the gear trunnions have cracks in them and they've cracked in the past. They've always been able to be welded. Well, this time they're they're not able to be welded. And uh, they're $30,000 a piece to have those things made. So nothing's impossible if you have $30,000 to replace that part. The problem with us is we generate our money by going out and flying the airplane and if you can and, and selling rides and stuff like that it doesn't take us long to make thirty thousand dollars it costs us a lot to do it but it doesn't take long so if we can't get the airplane out on the road because of maintenance issues then we can't pay to fix the maintenance issues and that's the same whether you're flying a piper cub or you're flying a b29 it's the same it just happens diamond lil um it really needs some expensive work it's not beyond the scope of our crew chief's capabilities they are certainly very capable of doing it what we don't have is the money to pay for the parts that we need and we tried the route of getting uh used parts and parts of other b24s and we found a couple of of possibilities and just from a safety perspective they weren't good enough they would have worked but they just weren't good enough for our maintenance crew to use and so we have no option but to have those pieces made um there's very little on the airplanes as far as just general parts that you can't get or you can't find something to adapt. What is starting to be a little harder um, in the grand scheme of things is finding people who can do engine work dependably on round engines. Um, our engines are built by Anderson Aeromotive up in Idaho and they are second to none. They are absolutely great. But that being said, no matter how good you are, sometimes stuff goes wrong. They're just big round engines and stuff just breaks. And it's getting to be a smaller pool to draw from to get people that are talented enough to do the work. The general work is, is the general upkeep is no different than a Cessna. It's just on a completely different scale than what it is because the airplanes are so big. Well, and you know, what I would add to that is that you have phenomenally talented people out there like a Brad uh, that knows these things backwards and forwards, can identify the problems. And then uh, because of the CAF's uh, maintenance uh, capabilities and their aggressive nature of, of keeping on top of all of this, you're anticipating the problems before they're really happening in terms of being a, a critical thing. So that's a huge philosophy difference than um, several of the early operators of these airplanes were. So, uh, but I would say this, right now, the B-52 uh, is only 10 years into the half-life of it. So that's an airplane that will fly well over 100 years as an active bomber in the US Air Force. Uh, they were very interested in the B-29 because it was one of the first big, large uh, production air airplanes for them. And there's no reason why you can't fly these things forever. It does take money and it takes uh, knowledge to be able to know what it is that you're doing. But uh, I still remember Lloyd Nolan telling me this story that when the, the CAF was formed and really started taking shape in the early 60s, even though it was formed in the 50s. Uh, somebody from the Air Force had asked Lloyd, well, how long do you think you're going to be able to fly these airplanes? And he said, well, maybe 1980, maybe the mid 80s, if we're lucky. And here we are in 2020. Uh, so there's no reason why we can't keep on going forever if we're just uh, very careful, very safe. And, uh, you know, we 
are capable of going out and selling rides, which is a, another pioneering thing that the CAF did early on, uh, to be able to keep these magnificent um, testimonials to the brave uh, men that fought uh, and defended our freedom. And that's what, that is what the CAF is all about. That's truly what these airplanes are about, is to go out there and pay homage to them and to remind everybody that freedom ain't free. Yeah, it's, 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 I've always say that it's, it's not a question of whether or not we can fly these. It's a question of whether or not we don't fly these because we have to, we have to continue flying them. Um, because with the airplanes ending, that's when the stories end. that's when the history of it kind of slows down. And we've got the luxury of, as I always say, we've got the luxury of doing this with nobody shooting at us. And we have to do it as a memorial to the people who did this for real, because there was a time when people flew these airplanes for real and got shot and died for the very freedoms that we live under today. And the best testimony to them is flying these airplanes. And so it's not a question of whether we should, it's a whether it's a question of how do we continue to make this happen? And we can't it's do it without duty. support from members. We have to have the support from people to do it. Cubic dollars. Agreed. I couldn't end this webinar any better than what you guys just said about inspiring, honoring, remembering, and continuing on to educate. So thank you, Brad. Thank you, John, for being here. Thank you to our audience, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys next week. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye.